Every Saturday for the last 16 years, a group of anti-Jewish protesters have stood outside of the synagogue of Beth Israel Congregation here in Ann Arbor, harassing congregants, placing in front of the synagogue signs that say things like Jewish power corrupts, Zionism is racism, and resist Jewish power. The protest has gone on for 16 years. And a lot of people ask, why hasn't the city of Ann Arbor done anything about this? Well, now there's a lawsuit by the Lawfare Project, which is representing those congregants. Joining us this morning is the Director of Litigation of the Lawfare Project. We welcome to the Lucy Ann Land Show, Zipporah Reich. Zipporah, set this up for us and, and give us an idea of what the last decade and a half has been like for the congregants of Beth Israel Congregation, given what has transpired right outside their doors. Hi, Lucy Ann, and thanks for having me. Uh, first, I just want to clarify the Lawfare Project is co counsel together with Mark Sesselman, who's a Michigan um, attorney, and so uh, both of us are uh, counsel on the case. So um, the protesting has been going on, as you said, for 16 years, actually a little over 16 years, every Saturday during services, forcing uh, congregants and their children to see really vile, offensive, anti-Semitic signs. Um, the congregants have asked the city of Ann Arbor many times over the years to intervene, and their response has always been there was nothing they could do. But that was not true. The protesters were in violation of a city ordinance in the Unified Development Code, and the city could have enforced their ordinance, which would have placed restrictions on their protesting and had a beneficial effect for the plaintiffs. At and, one point, and, and what kind of restrictions could they have placed on them? So the restrictions were modest, but as I was saying, they would have had quite beneficial effects on uh, the whole situation. So, for example, one of the things that the ordinance would have forced the protesters to do was to hold their signs. What the protesters have been doing is showing up every Saturday and kind of camping out, um, you know, putting about maybe 25, 20 to 25 signs in the grass and then being free to just, you know, not have to work to hold the signs. Mm -hmm. And there was only about five or six protesters. So if they were forced to hold the signs, number one, it would have dramatically reduced the display from, you know, all those signs just to the amount of signs the protesters could have held. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, it would have uh, perhaps tired them and forced them, you know, not to have the energy to come out every single Saturday or at least not stay as long as they stayed, you know, uh, throughout the service, having to hold the sign. So it could have had a dramatic impact on, on the entire picketing situation. And what about the property where they are doing this at? This is on the area just past the sidewalk? So um, uh, the Unified Development Code Ordinance uh, section 5.24.10 makes it very clear as we can tell, that any signs erected on the public right of way are prohibited. And the grass is the public right of way. It's just it's unambiguous. Um, and uh, they are placing their signs there. Um, and like I said, in violation of the ordinance. Um, and the city chose to do nothing, even when asked by my co-counsel to do something about it. This is not a quiet protest, is it? Well, it's 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 been you know created quite a ruckus. Um, obviously, the signs that um, you know are being put out are very offensive, um, and so no, I wouldn't call it a quiet. Uh, well, is there is there chanting? Is there chanting? Is there yelling? Is, is well, they they do say things, and you know they get cars to honk, um, you know stuff like that. It's not, um, you know, a very, very loud protest, uh, but it's definitely not a super quiet protest either. And there's people challenging them, and then there's kind of arguing back and forth, and the police showing up. I mean, it's creating quite a ruckus. And Zipporah, what is happening inside the synagogue while this is going on? Can, can Are they aware uh, that this, is, d during the services, is it, is, it, is it apparent that there's a disruption outside? Um, well, first of all, there's, there's no real way to avoid seeing the protesters when you come into service. Um, they're, they're practically right outside the synagogue. And like I said, people are bringing their children, um, and so it's very, very offensive. And it, it really is horrible 
Um, there are many people I've talked to, some who've written affidavits um, in our legal briefs. Uh, they, you know, have had very traumatic experiences and, in fact, have stopped going to synagogue uh, because of it, I know, as children and even as adults. So it's had a significant impact on the congregants. The person who is driving this, Henry Herskovitz, and we've talked with him in the past. It's been a few years, though. He maintains he's standing up for Palestinians who are enduring what he says is oppression and violence under the Israeli government. Okay. Ironically, he, he is of Jewish heritage. Um, it had been reported recently, and I had never known this in, in all these years, that he used to be a member of Beth Israel. Is that correct? So I don't want to speak to what his membership was. Um, I do want to say that it's ludicrous to say that your entire program of picketing is targeted towards Palestinian rights when you have signs that say Jewish power corrupts, res resists Jewish power. Those are stereotypical anti-Semitic tropes that have fueled hatred towards Jewish people for centuries and caused Jewish genocides and blood libels throughout history. This has nothing to do with the Palestinians, although he also says anti-Israel things and also says stuff about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So in this report, it, it, it said that he had had a falling out. Is this more of a personal uh, vindictive type of, of thing, or is this really about Palestinian versus Israeli rights? I, it, it doesn't make sense to me at all. And I know this is a yeah. question for, for Mr. Herskovitz, but from your perspective, representing uh, as co-counsel for the congregants of, of Beth Israel, uh, is this more of a personal attack? So I don't want to speak for Henry Herskovitz. I don't feel like I'm in the in position to, to talk about his intentions. Um, but what I can say is you're very right. It does feel very much like a personal attack because if you think about it, the congregants of the synagogue have nothing to do, well, not nothing to do, but they're not the state of Israel. They're not government actors. Why would you even, even if it was just about the Palestinians and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, why would you be protesting in front of a synagogue for 16 years when the synagogue's uh, congregants or the synagogue leadership are not the Israeli government? That doesn't even make sense. So well, I have to agree with you on that. And, and some people were questioning if, it, if he really, if this really was about Palestinian versus Israeli rights, why wouldn't you take it to other locales uh, within the absolutely. county? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Not only that, he should come to protest in front of the Israeli consulate. He should go to Washington, protest in front of the Israeli embassy, go to Israel and protest there. Mm -hmm. I mean, protesting in, you know, protesting in front of a synagogue where there's just congregants is completely ludicrous and unacceptable. So let's talk about the specifics on this lawsuit. We're talking with Zipporah Reich. She's the director of litigation at the Lawfare Project. They are co-counsel along with Mark Susselman, a Michigan attorney, in this lawsuit filed against this group of protesters and the city of Ann Arbor is included in this lawsuit. This is pitting First Amendment right to, to, to freedom of, of religion versus freedom of speech. Is that correct? Okay, so first of all, this is a very, very lengthy complaint, and we have many, many, many averments. Um, so to be clear, um, we do have some freedom of speech versus freedom of religion uh, claims in this complaint, but it's certainly not all of the complaint. But what I can say about um, the interplay between freedom of speech and freedom of religion is that in two of the claims, we argue that both the city and the protesters violated the plaintiff's First Amendment right to practice religion free from harassment. The city, by virtue of not enforcing their ordinance, and the protesters, pursuant to a federal statute, which says that when a state assists private citizens in implementing their own prejudices, they are acting in collusion, and the citizens become state actors, that's how the citizens have, are also acting as state actors and therefore are impinging on the congregants' um, First Amendment right to practice their religion um, free from harassment. And I'm making that clear because a First Amendment right can only be violated by a government actor. That's interesting. So what's the next step in this lawsuit? Where does this sit right now? So um, I also want to say, just, just to be clear, um, and I don't want to lose this point because it's so important, is that um, 
the protesters have a right to freedom of speech. Um, and the Lawfare Project is in no way trying to shut down the message of the protesters. In fact, the Lawfare Project is the great defender of free speech. However, we believe that, um, you know, you cannot use free speech to, or, or, or speech to impinge on the rights of other people. And um, because freedom of speech is not absolute, it exists in the context of competing rights. Mm -hmm. And if speech is being used to trample on other people's rights, then time, place, and manner restrictions must be placed on their speech. This ensures that the protesters get to convey their message, but it also forces them to do it in a way that does not trample on the rights of others. And that's something that so, you think the city could have, uh, could, could have corralled in. By, by stipulating those kinds of things? Well, the city could have at the very least enforced its ordinance, and then, um, you know, we are asking the court. Basically, in our legal papers, we're asking the court to place the same kinds of reasonable time, manner, and place restrictions on the protesters that the United States Supreme Court and many other high courts have done numerous times before to protect the rights of citizens whose rights were being violated in the same way our plaintiff's rights are being violated in this case because, um, for example, as I was saying, it's not just about, you know, impinging on their rights to, uh, to practice their religion free from harassment. They're doing many things like engaging in targeted picking, picketing in a residentially zoned area. Mm -hmm. um, the Supreme Court has continuously found that that's not okay and that you can force protesters not to target uh, picket at a re in a residential zone uh, in a residential zone, and they're also forcing plaintiffs to be a captive audience. They want if they want to go to synagogue, they have to hear the message over and over again. Again, the U.S. Supreme Court has has found consistently that that's not okay. Um, they're also inflicting emotional harm on children, and when it comes to children, the um, they're accorded a standard of protection that's higher than adults when it comes to how much insult they're expected to tolerate. And then finally, well, not finally, but another one is that they're violating the rights of the plaintiffs under a Michigan civil rights statute, um, the Elliot Larson uh, statute, which makes it illegal to deny an individual the full and equal enjoyment of the services of a place of public accommodation as a result of their religion, which is what they're doing. So the, you know, our claims are numerous, and that's just some of them. Um, and like I said, there are time, place, and manner restrictions that are consistently placed on speech when the speech is impinging on the rights of other people. That's what's happening in this case, and we're asking the court to intervene by, um, you know, eventually we expect to uh, file a preliminary injunction forcing um, the protesters you know, hopefully with the help of the court, to, uh, you know, protest in a manner that still allows them to communicate their message. Because let me be very clear, Luciana, as I said before, we're staunch defenders of the First Amendment right to free speech. And we believe that even though the protesters are spewing hateful venom that are lies against Jewish people, we still feel that they have every right to say what they want to say. Are you surprised, Zippor, that in this time that we're living in, when you look at certain protests across the country and how if someone is attacking someone directly uh, with these kinds of tropes and, and uh, uh, things, that, that it isn't looked upon that way when it's resist Jewish power, Jewish power corrupts, when, when those uh, phrases are, are displayed on a sign versus the kinds of things that we've seen um, against perhaps Arab Americans here, and, and immediately you see that the authorities move in on something like that. Absolutely. I feel like um, if this had happened to any other minority group, there would be public outrage, public outrage, if there was suddenly protests every single time there was a mosque service uh, and they were protesting even about ISIS or, pro or saying horrible things about Muslims. And, and rightfully so. They mm -hmm. should have immediate intervention. So what's happening here is absolutely outrageous. Um, and we feel like, you know, we need to do something to stop it, which is why we've joined this co-counsel. Can you give our listeners an idea on the timeline on this and what to expect next? So, uh, you know, courts are, are funny that way. It's really, really hard. It's really difficult to give a timeline. At this point, um, 
there are some motions that have been submitted, um, and they're kind of technical motions that I don't think you would necessarily uh, understand all that well. Mm -hmm. Um, But our next kind of uh, real step is going to be to file a preliminary injunction and ask the court to immediately set those time, place, and manner restrictions that, like I said, the Supreme Court of the United States and so many other courts in this country have repeatedly done for plaintiffs who are very similarly situated to the plaintiffs in this case. And is this the first time there has actually been a lawsuit? 16 years of this. Well, you know, unfortunately, we didn't know that this was going on and because we're headquartered in New York, mm-hmm. um, although the Lawfare Project, um, you know, is a, is a nonprofit litigation fund, and, and we have attorneys in our network all over the country and all over the world, but we were just made aware of this recently, and, as, and when we were made aware of it, we immediately looked into it and, and, and signed on. But yes, it's, it's my understanding that uh, nobody did, um, you know, file a lawsuit. And I think part of the issue is, just so you understand, is that um, people get very kind of concerned when there's free speech involved. Right. Um, and I think the issue is that people don't realize that uh, free speech doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not a right that's absolute. It exists in a context of other rights, and it's extremely important to defend protected speech. And it's extremely, it's just as important and extremely important to protect the rights of people that are, um, uh, you know, whose rights are being impinged because somebody is using that free speech to impinge on their rights. Well, and I think we're throwing words, around the, the we, we, I think that to, in today's society, we throw around the phrase free speech in ways that uh, it was not meant uh, to be intended and it wouldn't hold up in court either. I think people use that a lot in situations where it doesn't apply. Uh, and, right. I, and I will say this, I, I think that, you know, as, as someone who's lived in this town from the time I was a little girl, the Beth Israel congregation, they have been, I think they've been very quiet on this. I don't know how they've endured this this long. And I think they've been very respectful despite what has been going on outside their doors. I was really glad to see this lawsuit just to, so we can get some kind of determination from the courts as to how this can move forward from here. We'll be following this. It has been a pleasure talking with you this morning on this. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Zipporah Reich, uh, she's the director of litigation for the Lawfare Project, which is a global network of legal professionals that contribute their skills, time, and expertise to defending the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and pro-Israel community and fighting discrimination wherever they see it. Thank you, Zipporah. We'll talk again. Thank you. And you're listening to Ann Arbor's Talk Station, 1290 WLBY. WLBY. WLBY.